Hey everyone, my name is Nathan Tabor and I'm a Principal Product Manager here at Amazon Web Services. I'm really excited to be talking about uh, saying goodbye to YAML engineering with the CDK for Kubernetes. I'm going to be joined today by my friends and colleagues Elad Ben Israel, who's a Principal Engineer here at AWS, and also Eli Polonsky, who's a Software Development he Engineer here at AWS. And um, all of us work on Kubernetes and the CDK project, and we're really excited to share with you um, what we've been working on and, and some of the things that um, you, know, you can do using the CDK and the CDK for Kubernetes. All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. So we have a few things we're going to go over today. This is a, a hands-on interactive demonstration session. So I'm going to spend a few minutes um, right now talking about, you know, what's the deal with YAML? Um, how can we do more with the YAML that we have? How can we use YAML as part of the system? Um, talk about CDKs and, and how CDKs help solve some of the common problems that we see um, people in the Kubernetes community having around YAML, especially as they define and build really complex applications uh, across the organizations. Um, and then we have a really awesome deep dive hands-on demo that Ellie and Alad are going to give. They're going to go all the way through um, how to deploy an app end-to-end -end with a CDK for Kubernetes on a Kubernetes cluster. And then finally, we're going to have a really quick wrap-up. So I'm really excited that you've joined us for this session at KubeCon. Uh, here we are live from home, and um, let's go ahead and get started. So let's talk about YAML. YAML is freaking awesome. I mean, YAML is is the the bleeding uh, the beating heart, right, of a Kubernetes cluster. It's how we configure all of the stuff that we run using Kubernetes. And YAML is great because it's really easy for humans to read. It's something that um, anybody can open up a, a configuration spec. They can look at it. They can understand exactly what's going on and exactly. Um, what we intend for the system to do. It's universal. Um, it's also declarative, which is great in a system like Kubernetes because you declare exactly what you want and then you expect the API server and all the other resources to take care of instantiating that declared state and maintaining that declared state. So YAML is, is a great um, language for how you want to declare things on your cluster. And it's also really good because it's static. And things that are static are um, easy to work with, they can be versioned, um, you know, they can be shared and distributed and, and understood uh, at a single point in time. So that's really good. So YAML is a really excellent uh, building block for our applications. And it's not too hard to use when you have a few things. If you have um, you know, a handful of deployments or a handful of services in your cluster, YAML is really great. You can probably just write out a YAML spec uh, really easily and start running some basic applications on Kubernetes. But as you grow, and especially as you start to adopt uh, systems defined in YAML across your organization, you end up with this YAML engineering. There is a lot of boilerplate that you start having to add and that opens up room for errors. Um, sharing becomes kind of manual and hacky, right? Like projects often start with these off-the-shelf examples, then they start quirking, copying, and pasting configurations from vendors, from other companies, from community-maintained repositories, and maintaining these files over time takes a lot of work. And there's a lot of different tools that we've seen created by the community. Some, like Helm, are really good at packaging YAML and making it easy to uh, bundle YAML together. Um, but they don't actually necessarily solve some of the underlying problems about customizations and um, all the different tooling that you have to use. How do you update across lots of different things? Especially when, um, if you're a human, right? Like if you're a developer and you've never actually touched Kubernetes YAML, it's this whole other world to actually begin to start to run your application on Kubernetes. And, and we find that that can be a, a bit of a learning curve for people. And most developers are, are used to working with general purpose languages, right? So general purpose languages are, are what we actually build our applications in. Um, they tend to be uh, specialized. Um, they can be functional or imperative. They are dynamic. And there's a whole uh, ecosystem of tooling and workflows around how, how do we define applications using these general purpose languages. Um, so what the Cloud Development Kit for Kubernetes does is it's an open source framework that lets you define Kubernetes infrastructure using these general purpose popular programming languages. So um, the CDKs 
is really awesome. It lets you go from code to config, defining um, Kubernetes applications and architectures using um, uh, you know, popular and familiar programming languages. And it, it gets rid of a lot of the pain of making sure that you get all the boilerplate right. So you can generate that well-formatted YAML for your applications every single time. Um, because it actually you're defining your applications in code, you can use code libraries and you can actually define the format for how you want a particular application within a cluster to work as a code library. And then you can share that and you can update it easily without any help heavy lifting. So you can go and you can update, you know, how do I define a web service at my organization? And let's say tomorrow you come out with, okay, every web service now needs to use uh, endpoint slices, right? And you can actually implement that as part of the library that defines how users at your company use, um, you know, Kubernetes web services, and you can import that. All those developers can import that into their CDKs libraries and then they can easily um, begin using those new features within the API without necessarily having to understand um, how to implement them all perfectly in the YAML and, and having to really deeply understand the Kubernetes API to get started. I think the most important part of this project and what's really exciting for us at AWS is that CDKs lets you run everywhere. So CDKs is, is not a, a system that's designed just for AWS. Um, it runs locally on your machine and it generates Kubernetes standard YAML that you can deploy to any Kubernetes cluster running anywhere. And this lets you standardize across on-premises and any cloud. So um, today we support uh, four languages with CDKs, TypeScript, JavaScript, Python, and Java. Uh, and we're looking at supporting uh, Go and .NET and many more in the future. And like I was saying, um, CDKs is, is, lets you share these best practices as libraries. It, it makes them easy to maintain and, and it's easier to share than templates. So you can use CDKs to standardize how you define Kubernetes across your organization and across any environment. Um, and then what's really cool is that at the end of the day, what you're using is just standard Kubernetes YAML. So um, that means that today, if your developers or if you are writing your application in a general purpose programming language, and then you're deploying that through a CD pipeline out to your cluster. Um, with the CDK for Kubernetes, you can now also write your application definition and your specification for how you want that application to run in the same language. And then you can deploy that out through a GitOps, through a CD pipeline onto your cluster. So you can go from having two very different flows from writing your code and getting it into production and uh, actually unify that and use the same set of tools all the way through the process from writing your application, defining how it should run, and then using continuous deployment and continuous integration to get that out um, onto your cluster. So let's take a quick look at how this actually works. So in the CDKs, you have a CDKs application this represents the overall application that, that you're going to be running on your cluster. And then you have a series of charts. And charts are different logical modules within your application for different functions. And within a chart, you can have one or more constructs. And a construct defines um, one or more uh, resources, Kubernetes resources, that you want to uh, instantiate and define together. So uh, for example, I may have a deployment and a pod that I'm going to define together as one construct. And then you take that and you synthesize that into a YAML or a Helm chart. You kubectl apply that to your cluster or use a, a GitOps CD tool to get that onto your cluster. And when that YAML goes onto your cluster, then we instantiate um, the Kubernetes resources. This is just like normal, um, just like you would do uh, if you had written that, that YAML file yourself. And so let's look at the big picture. So. The CDKs application is effectively your source code. This is the source for how you want to define your Kubernetes application. The CDKs CLI, which is our, our CLI tool, acts as the compiler. And the CLI executes that source and synthesizes YAML or Helm chart. That is your assembly language, right? And then we deploy that onto the Kubernetes cluster, which is your processor, and actually instantiates those Kubernetes resources to run your application. And so there are three main components to the CDKs. 
There's the core framework, which is all the different constructs and the construct library um, that, that makes that up. We also have CDKates Plus. And CDKates Plus is a high-level library that defines common constructs in an opinionated fashion. So CDKates Plus makes it really easy to get started with CDKates um, by kind of giving you the core building blocks that you need to start uh, building and running Kubernetes applications. And then we have the CDKates CLI. And the CLI um, allows you to um, define which version of the Kubernetes API that you want to be using as part of your CDKates um, app. And there's some really nifty functionality in the CDKates CLI that we're going to be talking about that allows you to select which Kubernetes version you're using and then ensures that all of the YAML that you synthesize uses the correct format for that version of the Kubernetes API. It also lets you import um, custom resource definitions and use those as part of your uh, CDKates app. And so these three components uh, work together to allow a really nice system that lets you go from general purpose language to Kubernetes YAML. All right, so that's a, a very brief introduction to the CDKates. Let's go ahead and uh, jump over. Uh, we're gonna fly halfway around the world to um, Elad and Eli joining us from Tel Aviv, and they're gonna give you uh, a deep dive into uh, building and running an application using the CDKates. All right, go ahead, Elad. Eli, take it away. Thanks, Nate. So let's get going and uh, write some code. I guess that's why we're here, uh, and we've got plenty of time. So my name is Elad. I'm a principal engineer at AWS. I've been working on the CDK project for the past three years. And since this is a recorded session, I, I, realized, I figured it's going to be very boring if I'm just going to speak to myself for an hour, both for me and for you. And so I asked uh, my colleague, Ellie, uh, who's working with me on uh, the CDK for Kubernetes project, to join me. And we're going to do this together. Uh, let me uh, invite him, and he's going to tell you a little bit about himself, and we can get started. Hi, Ali. Hi, Elad. Hi, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. So yeah, my name is Ali. I work with Elad on the CDK and the AWS CDK for, uh, for almost uh, a year now. Um, excited to see this, uh, to see, to do this uh, session. We've got a lot to cover, so, so let's get started. Yeah, we actually planned, you know, we sat down and planned and there's so much stuff to talk about and so many rat holes to go. And so I, I asked Ellie to keep me honest and make sure that I pull me out of those rat holes as much as possible so we can actually get something achieved. What, what, what we said we we're going to do is first kind of walk through the basics to make sure that everybody's on the same page. I know that some of you are probably used CDK for Kubernetes. Some of you have never heard of it. And so, yeah. you know, following Nate's uh, introduction, I hope you have a sense of what it is, but I actually want to show you, you know, hands-on how, how it feels to use it. Uh, and then we're going to just try to build a project together and, and you know, have some cathartic, cathartic experience, I think. Like that, <laughs> that's always a good one, I guess. Yeah, definitely. All right, cool. So I guess uh, the first thing we need to do or talk about is I, I assume you have some kind of local setup or some kind of Kubernetes cluster you have so we can play around with, right? Yes, 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 yes. I've and got... I'm, going, I'm going to assume you have Kind because it's great and I use it too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for local, for local development, we love Kind. Uh, I love yeah. Kind. Uh, awesome project, really, really stable. I think one of the things that we get asked a lot is uh, whether CDKates is just for AWS. And the answer is no. Uh, CDK for Kubernetes is for Kubernetes. And so <laughs> you can run on any Kubernetes cluster, whether it's yeah. on-prem, on the cloud. Uh, as Nate said, it basically just synthesizes man uh, YAML manifests. Uh, it's, if you think about it, it's kind of like a compiler. You write code, and you execute, and you get a manifest output. Yeah, oh. and then it's your choice what to do with it. You can exactly. deploy it anywhere. Yeah. And we'll see, we'll see all of that in a second. Uh, the second thing that I prepared in advance is uh, just an empty, kind of like an empty TypeScript project. Uh, we're going to use TypeScript. As Nate said, the CDK supports multiple programming languages, TypeScript, JavaScript, .NET, Java. Uh, okay. Go is coming up hopefully in yeah. the month, so that's going to be a very exciting I think very exciting for the Kubernetes uh, community, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. OK, uh, but this is basically just a regular TypeScript app. And what you see here is a boilerplate 
not boilerplate, but basically kind of like a starter application that was created by uh, a CD Kates init. CD Kates uh, is uh, shipped with a CLI called, unsurprisingly, CD Kates. And it has a bunch of commands. And one of them is init. It allows you to just initialize new projects in, in one of the supported languages. There's nothing fancy about these projects. They're just regular, you know, regular projects. In this case, you know, you can see that it uh, takes a dependency. Yeah, the dependency. Yeah, just comes with a with a few presets that'll help you get started with CDKs. Yeah, basically. quickly. But you can start with with from an empty TypeScript project. It's not really a... okay. And then the structure that you get here is kind of like um, uh, what we call the construct tree. Uh, and yeah. we'll, we'll talk more about constructs, I guess, later. But uh, um, okay. if the mental model is a tree, okay? So think, think. There's a root, and the root of the tree is the app. And then within the app, uh, you've got charts, charts, any number of charts. And uh, the reason is that every chart synthesizes into its own manifest. So you can decide what you want to do with this. You can just use a single chart and put all your resources in one manifest. You can split them up. You can create instant different versions of them for development or production or whatever, right? But you control yeah. it. Uh, and the way the tree is structured is by basically passing in the parent as the first parameter of, of the construct. And so in this case, I create a chart and I pass in the app. And you'll see this repeat and repeat itself every, uh, throughout, the, you know, throughout the programming model. And All right, so I see, I see it says define resources here. So uh, well, let's define resources. We should start, we should start defining to... resources. Which, yeah. which resource? Um, so I know that like, I want to talk about uh, the, 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 the kind of a, a, a very important aspect of CDKs and, you know, software engineering in general, which is this notion of, of layering. And I want us to show, to see all the different types of layering that CDKs, uh, CDKs offers. And let's start by, by using like the most basic layer uh, to define uh, objects. And let's just start with like a simple config map, right? That's something okay. that's super, super simple to configure. So let's let's see how you do that with like the most uh, fundamental unit in CDKs. Okay, and so if you think about it again, if you look at what the CDKs is, is supposed to generate or to synthesize, it's supposed to generate manifests, and yeah. so the manifests are structured as a, a collection of API objects, and so to that end, uh, CDKs is also bundled with a class called API object. It's also a construct, so it needs to bind to the tree. Uh, the first parameter is the scope. And as a rule of thumb, I'm, I'm always going to pass in this because I want to add this construct to the scope in which I'm actually defining it. So I know yeah. exactly what's going on within this scope. You want to keep, keep the locality of your resource. I want, yeah, I want this to be local to my chart in that sense. And we'll see what that means uh, if, uh, maybe later. And then I get a, a name for my API object. I can call it. Uh, config map, let's say. And if I look, if I ask the IDE um, to help me, then I see that I need API version and I need kind because both of those are required for all API objects. Yeah. Uh, you know, wherever they are. So I'm going to pass in this. So CDKs already enforces these kind of requirements, right? You can't configure any API object without an API version or kind. Right. That's, that's cool. Right, but then, as you can see, I don't get any other help here because API objects are typeless, right? Like, uh, the, you know, the library doesn't know that an API, this API object is a, is a config map. Yeah, and sometimes you have like a spec, um, but sometimes you don't. For example, config map doesn't have a spec property, right? It just has the data. Right. Um, so I can basically just know. put whatever, whatever I want here, right? Like, yeah. Here, uh, uh, data and I can put here zoo bar and it'll take it. It'll just take whatever I put here, whether yeah. it's part of the schema or not part of the schema. And, and then what, what do I do with this? How do I move on? What's the next step? Okay. I got my code right written. So let's see how do, how does the manifest actually get created, right? This is supposed to be translated to YAML eventually. Right. And so the way it works is basically I just run my application. Right, this application you see the last line in my application synth, and yeah. you'll see this also come you know repeating in other CDKs like the Kubernetes CDK, also uh, the Terraform CDK or the AWS CDK. And so if I run this application, uh, just like a regular node process, right? Yeah, just as a regular. In this case, it's a TypeScript node, but 
yeah yeah just as a regular node process there's no magic right like no no magic tricks you'll see that uh it created a disk directory and i've got my manifest here with my config map yeah well two two things are are bad here or well, not bad or weird here first it's it's invalid right there, this this <laughs> this zubar thing is is not really and when we try to deploy it it's going to fail and the other thing is that we see that the, it created a name for us for the config map. Yeah, and and we, we you know, didn't specify. I didn't specify it, and it wasn't required, which is actually yeah. weird because in in Kubernetes names are required for for resources, and and but this is actually a unique thing about uh, CDK for Kubernetes, and and a very key ingredient of CDKs. I didn't have to specify a name because CDK can allocate a name for this object based on where it is in the construct tree. And so if you look at this name, you actually you can actually identify the path, right? Like you say, hello, that's the name of my application. Hello, KubeCon. Sorry, hello, KubeCon is the name of my uh, stack, chart. Uh, my uh, chart. And config map is the name of my construct. And then we, we append this hash uh, to ensure that the, the whole thing is unique across the entire application. Yeah. And this is yeah, where no. these constructs uh, programming model comes into play. The, the, the reason we need the scope and name for every construct is exactly in order to be able to allocate these stable um, names for resources that are generated by the, uh, yeah. that are generated during execution. And, and an important thing is that these names, like from my experience, usually when you want to wire components together, you need access to the name. So what I found myself a lot of the times doing is, you know, obviously, inputting a specific name and then kind of repeating itself repeating myself around the the the, the, the yaml so i do need some kind of programmatic access to this name if it is generated for me so that i can pass it on to other uh, objects exactly and and so uh, like any object in the object oriented programming uh, constructs also have an api that you can access after the object is created and API objects have a pretty minimal API, right? Like you can access some of those properties. We actually plan to expand that a little bit in, uh, in our roadmap. But the, the interesting one is name. And you can see here, yeah. this is the name specified, either specified explicitly via metadata name. You can, you can still specify names of, uh, explicitly if you wanted. Yeah. But if you didn't, then you can actually just use this as a token, as a representation of the, of the actual name. I'll just give you, uh, you know, just to show you an example of what this can do. Let's create a, another config map at, that references the previous one. Okay, so let's uh, call it uh, ref of obj one. And yeah, it, and this is this is great because this is like it seems so simple, but you can't really do it inside a, a manifest, right? There's no inherent referencing mechanism, so you you're kind of forced to either template it or just repeat it. Exactly, and and it's a very important principle in, in healthy software engineering. Don't don't repeat yourself. Uh, yeah. At one at, at at one end, and the other part is like there's strong binding now between those two things that doesn't exist here, right? Like here, it's actually very loose. Uh, you see the you know you see this name actually repeating. You, you see this name actually uh, over here. Uh, and again, the beauty of this is that if this resource goes away. Then my compiler will yell at me. It will say, "Hey, obj, obj doesn't exist. What are, what are you referencing here?" So yeah. we 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 convert these this loose coupling that's very prevalent in configuration files and manifest and Kubernetes manifests. We'll see that quite a lot in in CDK with strong binding, strong coupling between things that represent logical connections, and the compilers can help us enforce those connections, which is very powerful. All right, cool. So this is this is great. Um, but I know I know like we we've, I mentioned that we have uh, multiple layers. So I want to talk about the next layer of, of API that CDKs can offer, and this is the an, an API that that goes beyond you know just the requirement of API version and kind, and it actually uh, lets you interact with a fully strong typed API for all of the Kubernetes uh, um, core objects, right? So instead of creating an API object, you can actually create a specific um, resource. So yeah. let's let's see how how you do that. Yeah. So the, the beauty of the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem is that uh, APIs are uh, well typed. They're all schematized. 
Kubernetes yeah. itself publishes an API, an open API specification for all of the Kubernetes API objects. Uh, custom resource definitions are schematized through JSON schemas. And so what we could do is we could basically read those schemas and automatically generate classes that represents each API object. And based on these schemas, they offer rich and object-oriented, they, they offer um, you know, strongly typed APIs for, the, for, for accessing these classes. Yeah, definitely. Like I can see myself going to these schemas and kind of and just manually writing the code that, that's need, that needed. But we have a tool that, that does that, right? That generates uh, the, the, the code based on this specification. Yeah, and so this tool is called CDK's import. Um, and it, it basically accepts a specification, something to import. And it supports either importing the Kubernetes API from the open API specification or Kubernetes CRDs. And as you all know, CRDs are the standard way to extend Kubernetes. And so any, any CRD that, you, that, that exists in the Kubernetes ecosystem can be automatically imported into a CDK application and used through strongly typed APIs, which is very powerful. Like we've seen people do really beautiful things with this and, and you get a very nice development ex developer experience for you know, working with all of the Kubernetes API ecosystem, not just the Kubernetes API. In this case, let's start with the Kubernetes API, the core API, just to give you a sense of what that looks like. And so I'm just gonna do K8S and that's gonna be importing the K8, uh, Kubernetes API with the default version. Uh, you can specify any version and it'll, it'll just use that version. Um, and so what import is doing, it creates a directory called import. It's becoming part of your project now. It's just yeah. that it emitted this TypeScript file in it. And if you're using Java, it'll be Java classes or Python or whatever language you're that's, using. That's very cool. And wait, wait until you see how we use it. <laughs> um, and so we're going to do import this into my, my application. I'm going to delete this. And now I get classes for all Kubernetes kinds. So basically, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between Kubernetes kinds and uh, constructs now. And let's let's yeah. should we do config map again or something else? No, no. Let's let's do something more interesting. Let's do let's try to create a deployment and see okay. see see how that feels. So again, see you see the construct signature, which is you know binding into the tree. Uh, let's call it dep one, and let's see what it means to define a deployment. Oh, so again, I see uh, missing selector and template, which is the require two required fields. But now if I actually ask my ID to help, you see that it's not just saying, hey, I want you know, a spec. It says exactly what is the yeah. schema of that spec. And so I can start you know, using the ID to help me with this thing. Uh, okay, so this needs containers. Okay, fair enough. Again, this is courtesy of the of the specification itself, right? The JSON schema that Kubernetes Open publishes. Um, yeah, and uh, any anything, and and we we actually also have seen a, a few things that there that are untyped, uh, and obviously those things will not have strong types. But if it if it has a strong type in the specification in the Open API specification, that it okay, it's going it, to still, be. it still needs the, it still needs a selector. Uh, yeah, this is this is this thing. I, I, like I remember, you know, doing Kubernetes um, manually with YAML, and actually, it's it's always kind of <laughs> bothered me a little bit. Why do I have to to keep repeating this uh, this definition? It feels it feels like it should be implicit. You mean the labels and the match labels? Yeah, because what you're essentially doing here is you're you're attaching labels to pods of this deployment and you're saying to the deployment hey please select these pods and, right. and that feels like the normal thing you would expect yeah, you, you're you're creating those pods for me of course yeah. i want you to select these yeah obviously yeah. you could do some magic tricks with this loose couple coupling yeah component. there are use cases for it there are use cases like you know um um gradual deployments and uh weighted uh Whatever, right? Like there's there's a lot of interesting stuff that you could do with this, but I think you know the the common use case is yeah. I just want the I, I just want to deploy these containers. That's kind of like yeah. basically just want to deploy containers. Yeah. Right. Right. But this is you know this is how the Kubernetes API looks like, and the L one and the layer one layer um, 
classes constructs we're we're completely we completely don't know about that right like as a as, because all of this is generated from the schema and so we can just represent the schema through strong typing which again is extremely valuable right like uh, it, uh, there are many IDE extensions and tools and schema validations and linters that people use to uh, make sure that their manifests are uh, correct. But we actually have all this, all these capabilities in, in you know, strongly typed uh, languages. And so it's very easy for us to just lift this experience into those, uh, into the, into these IDs. Okay, so let's deploy okay. um, stuff. You know what, a lot. I'm gonna play the time card here. Okay. Uh, we need to we need to speed speed things up a little bit. So let's let's just uh, instead of deploying, let's just see like the, let's take it to the next level and deploy the the, the next kind of uh, of API. So the the, the last uh, layering in in this whole experience is something we call CDK plus, and CDK plus is basically um, a library that we vend uh, as part of the CDK toolchain, and it provides these uh, higher level APIs for the same objects, for the same Kubernetes objects. So if you take a look at this, at this API, we can see that, yeah, there's, there's, there's a bunch of, of uh, resources. They're the same as the prior level ones, but they offer slightly different APIs. So let's see how we can rewrite this deployment using these APIs. Okay, so I've got deployment here. And now I actually, I can use, you, so again, let, I'll, I'll just uh, yeah. recap for a second, and then we can. I'll show you exactly how to implement this using the what we call L2s, level two yeah. APIs. And and those level two APIs, as you saw earlier, the Kubernetes, uh, the CDK plus semantics is the same semantics as the core Kubernetes resources. We're not inventing a new world in a sense. We're just offering a higher level set of APIs, not a higher level set of abstractions. If that makes sense, right? Like the, I'm distinguishing between uh, elevating the API abstraction versus elevating the mental model, right? And we'll, we'll actually see what that means in the in, a, in 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 the future. But for for this in this case, I'm just I still have deployment. I still need to understand yeah. the concept of deployment, and I can actually specify um, my deployment specifications here. I don't need. I, I, there's no concept of a spec and a me, like spec is actually you know some kind of a a mechanical detail of how Kubernetes manifests are structured, but it yeah. doesn't, it, we don't need that in at that layer. So I can just specify containers, for example. Yeah, uh, from a user perspective, that's that's all I want to do. Like I want to I want to tell the deployment which container to run. Right. And then the other thing that I have here is actual mu mutation methods. Because in the CDK, the way we, we kind of think about it is that you can mutate the tree as much as you want until you synthesize. And when you synthesize, everything becomes immutable and then goes into the immutable world of desired state-based deployment. But as long as you're inside the CDK application and in the execution of the application, you can reach out to objects and change them. And, and so it, it gives you a very, very powerful programming model. And you can do things like you know, passing over the deployment to some, some library yeah. that will add a sidecar container, right? right. And, and that's very powerful yeah and so in that case i can just call add container and then i can create a container object sorry container object and specify image which is required yeah and, so just take yeah and i'm just going to use the same command and i don't even have to specify the name although it's required over there because yeah there's some default that's pretty sane right like call it main because that's the main main container. Oh, what happened here? Okay, so now I've got two deployments and that's it, right? Like, do I need like the labels and so, no, because- Well, it didn't, it didn't require, previously when we used the, the, the lower level APIs, right? We had to specify a selector and, we, and if we, had, we specify a selector, then we have to specify labels. But here, it doesn't say that we need to. So let's assume we don't. Let's assume okay. that something assume happens. Don't. And so we're executing again. Yeah, now let's uh, now let's see what what our manifest actually looks like. Okay, so this is my plus, Deploy. and you see that it actually allocated a label for me, which is pretty nifty. I didn't have to do it, right? Like just it it has the ability to allocate stable, uh, unique names, which is coming from the construct tree, the capability the construct tree offers, and and so I could basically just describe my intent, right? Like my intent is 
I want the deployment. I want to deploy a single container. That's it. Done. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, uh, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, should we deploy this? I don't know. You're, you seem like you're uh, in a hurry. What's the timing uh, like? Yeah, let's uh, let's uh, let's let's deploy this and start. And and, and in the meantime, let's also add uh, add the prune prune labels to our chart, which okay. you can talk a little bit about. So for for those of you who are not familiar with prune labels, um, when you deploy manifests to Kubernetes, um, the kubectl uh, doesn't know which resources you want to remove, right? Because those manifests only contain the desired state, and the desired state contains only the stuff that you want to exist. And so prune labels are, are a way to basically tell kubectl, hey, this is what I want to, to deploy. And everything else that's labeled with some label that's not in that list should be erased because it was basically yeah. here from a previous iteration in a sense. And yeah, it's, it's how desired it's state deployment. Uh, yeah, it fits more nicely into this desired state workflow where you remove something from your manifest. You're essentially saying, I want to actually delete this from the cluster. Okay, let's see. I, I got to see the logs, right? <laughs> okay, logs. Hmm. Uh, no logs. Oh, because I did bash, yeah. Bash. No. So now I've, I'm changing, right? And redeploying. So this is kind of like my inner, inner loop cycle. Basically, change my code, synthesize it, deploy. Yeah. And then hopefully, now I've got some stuff that's Yay! Yeah. All right, cool. Prune labels, right? So let's add. Let's add the prune. Let's get rid of this uh, deployment. Uh... Oh yeah, let's let's add the prune labels and, yeah. then, and then we'll. Yeah. Okay, so the way prune labels work is basically I'm just going to add to this apply. I'm going to say prune, and then I get, and I have to specify a label that that's that's you know splat you know basically consistent across all the resources. So I need to actually label all my resources with the same label so I, so this prune can work. I can call, I'll just call it prune and we'll just make up some name, boo -boo. Uh, my boo boo prune label. And, but now I actually need to label all those things. Yeah. And the nice thing, again, because this is a programming uh, language and we can do things like uh, traverse the tree and mutate it during runtime, during synth synthesis, then CDK offers this ability to specify labels at this at the at the chart level. I can yeah. also specify a namespace at the chart level. And, and it's so, going to and it's going to apply the labels to all resources inside that chart. To all API resources inside that chart and inside all of the yeah. all of the child constructs within that chart. Yeah. So it's a very That's amazing. Powerful. Like uh, I I I I wouldn't imagine how how to do it like otherwise if I have, you know, Copy a thousand paste, resources paste, now and I need paste, to apply paste. Prune labels. How do I do that? Yeah, yeah I don't know. I, I, it's it's not fun. That's for sure. So now all I have to do is basically say prune boo boo. And before before I run this, let me. Yeah, I gotta, let's let's put that. I gotta just synthesize first to to see how it looks. <laughs> I'm sorry. I still I don't trust this thing as much and yet. Um, but you can see here that I have this prune label here. And I've got this prune label here, which which is great, and so I, now I do. Okay, so I'm just going to do this like do it like this, uh, and so it's going to basically configure all my resources to include my label, and I can even do this. And yeah, so it basically applied all all like the prune label to all my resources, and now now we can actually get rid of the deployment here. Yeah, let's get rid of this one because it's too long, and yeah. let's run this again. And it should it should prune one of the deployments, uh, of course. <laughs> yeah, I think you can also add this command to your to your yarn uh, script. Yeah, cool. Okay, I'm just gonna add this command here, right, as a script. Yeah. Call it deploy, and then I can do yarn deploy. Cool. So that's our that's our iteration basically. All right, and cool. Another thing that I'm gonna do to make my life even easier, I'm gonna do this. So I can just do perfect. All right, so okay. now we have we have that, we have our workflow, we have kind of all the, the layering figured out. And now we're gonna start building our, our application. And okay. and this time we're we're actually gonna create 
an abstraction, not just like a, a, an API abstraction, but actual a different mental model, right? We wanna now we wanna create something for our users, and our users are developers who don't necessarily know what deployments are or what services are. They just wanna write their code, and we wanna provide some kind of platform for them to do it. So I think like one of the most you know simplest yet powerful kind of use cases to to actually deploy live applications is something like a like a gateway like an api gateway where you can specify you know like uh, http po uh, routes http paths uh, that are backed by docker applications uh, that the user writes so let's 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 try to let's try to implement like the simple a simple counter counter uh, application right where you have slash counter to to return the current value of the counter and you can also do post on the counter to increment the counter okay i'm not uh, full i'm not sure i fully understand but i guess let's start with the api and with the maybe that will help me understand exactly what you what you want yeah. to so i cleaned this up a little bit uh, while you were uh, describing maybe that's why i didn't understand <laughs> <laughs> all right cool so let's start I, like for me the api i want to provide my users right yeah is i want my users to write to, to instantiate some kind of api gateway api router let's call it router right let's call it an api router okay or just just router, router maybe yeah. router router just router Okay. And then be a construct, so it, it has to look like this. And then what? Yeah. Install like install applications on the router. Basically, yeah. Basically, map or route different paths, different HTTP mm -hmm. paths to to uh, to different handlers. So uh, we're gonna do counter? Uh, slash counter, right? Yeah, let's do slash counter. And this has to somehow map or you know be implemented by some docker application i don't know what is it but it's it's docker okay right so i want to point to a directory with a docker file that i can build and just have it run my, uh, it. my path. okay so let i love i love uh, i can do this let's call it router counter uh, app yeah. and i'll show you that i've written these node.js demos like many times <laughs> <laughs> node alpine so you said counter yeah. let me see so something like this and then add dot to app and then run user bin and node app in. every time every time i see you write this i'm amazed <laughs> <laughs> and then a javascript is going to be javascript i'm going to do simple http server uh yeah. Yeah. And we have a counter here, starts with zero, I guess. Server listen on 8080. And then if it's, uh, sorry, if if it's a get method, I guess we can yes, just, like, you know, just increment it, you know, like just uh, print the counter response, right? Counter equals counter. Plus plus counter. Yeah, sure. Right? Yeah. Just That's like on any. Good enough. Yeah, good enough. That sounds good. And uh, I know you always forget to handle sick terms when you okay. write Docker applications. Handled. Should we go cool. test it or do, do you think it's going to work? Should we test it locally before? Yeah, let's let's just uh, build it quickly. quickly right, counter. Cool. Yay! All right. Okay. Signal handling. No. no. Oh, maybe sig it's sig it's sig in. Again, yes. And I'm going to also add a little log here. Because then I'll know that this thing is actually working. And then docker kill, sorry, docker ps. Yeah, this, this sigint handling is. Uh... Okay, great. Okay. All so, right. 
So now I need to, I want to basically point to this directory, right? So counter, yeah. like that would be the ideal API, right? Because I don't. That, that would be the ideal. Yeah, I, well, let's try to make this work. Okay, so I guess API driven design, right? Um, yep. I'm going to create, create uh, router.ts. And as we said, it's construct. So construct, creating constructs is actually extremely easy. Uh, you just create something that extends the construct base class, and then it has to accept the scope and ID, and that's it. This is a construct. So you see, from from that perspective, we can now import it into my app. Now I need to include. And do you know that TypeScript has? Uh, you could do this. Are you familiar with this? I just do yeah. a clear method, and then I just I jump over here. And yeah. it declares a method that supposedly <laughs> this is the path, right? Yeah, this should this be the path, and this should be the directory or image here. yeah. Okay, very cool. Okay, so so this I is know, like from the user's perspective, but under this, this is that nothing. That's right? it. That should be that should be the 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 implementation or you know the the invocation as far as the user is concerned. Okay. So. For the implementation, I know we'll probably need to use an ingress because uh, ingress has this capability of routing specific HTTP paths to different services, right? To different Kubernetes services. So okay. let's let's start with you know importing or you know using the ingress construct for, of CDKs plus, and okay. see what kind of API it has to offer us. Okay, so basically every router would have an ingress resource. I also uh, yeah. I have an ingress controller installed in my kind, like Nginx uh, yeah. standard stuff. So basically, I can use an ingress, and it supposedly should work. Let's see the API behind behind the ingress. Yeah, so we're going to use the the add rule. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff here, but but the add rule API is basically saying, give me a path, an HTTP URI, right, uh, and. Uh, and the and the handler of that path is something that's called an ingress backend. Okay, Essentially, but, a backend is just a Kubernetes service. Um, mm, but I need to call this from here. So from this yeah. method, right? So I need to basically store this somewhere as a local variable, as a, a local member. Yeah, and this is nice. Like this is the like post instantiation APIs. You can imagine passing this router to different components of your code. And each of them installing its own kind of path. Oh, yeah. cool! So it's like the like the add container stuff that we sort of. Yeah. Like. This okay, is so now the path is here, and the backend. The API so this is yeah. Let's get the okay. So a, a few of a few of the, a few of like our uh, patterns is to do, uh, like the the from methods right. From methods is when you when when a when a resource is configured, with something that's called the union type where, where you can pass in a few properties, but you can only use one of them, right? They're mutually exclusive. Mm. So every time you see this kind of this pattern, you'll see in the CDK, you'll see the from pattern. Okay. So an ingress backend, we can create it from a service. So let's try, let's do oh, that. So it's like a static method that returns as an instance. It's basically a factory, a factory method. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here I, I basically need a service to to get that. Well, obviously, we'll obviously need a service. Um, okay. So now I need to create a service, but, if, but the service is uh, is yeah. fronting so the service, deployment, the service, right? So exactly. I guess I need the deployment first, right? Exactly. The service serves a deployment, right? You don't create a service just like that. You, you, I know you how to create, create deployments already. Let's do it. Let's create a deployment, and then. Deployment dot add container, new container. Oh wait, but I need to. I, I, yeah. I, so what do we do here? So we actually need to build, right? We need to build the directory, and we need to extract the specific digest, you know, of the of that specific build, and use this as our image URL, right? So yeah. I actually published this. I actually published this library uh, a few days ago uh, that does exactly this. As luck would have it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me show you. It's pretty. It's pretty nifty. It's called. So I publish it to npm. It actually uses also uses JSII, so uh, we can publish it to like all the package managers, like uh, Maven and PyPy, and yeah. um, it's called CDKates Image. And I'll show you what it how it works. 
It's an image construct which takes care of building and pushing Docker images that can be used in CDK's application. And so basically the way it works, you specify a directory, a local directory. Uh, you can also specify a registry into which you want to push the image. And not, yeah, and we mentioned we have like a local registry yeah, on exactly my setup, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you can you can create a deployment and specify that image you the images URI through dot URI. So it basically gives you your the the exact URI of that image that it's built. So it's the yeah. nice thing about this is that you don't have to separate the image building and publish a uh, pushing. Uh, flows with your synthesis flows. And, and it's very common in, in the Kubernetes world that image building and pushing is done together with you know building your application because this is basically the build stage of your of your CDKs, pipeline. CDKs is a build tool, right? So it makes sense for the build tool to actually do this uh, yeah. building. <laughs> exactly. But you could do anything you want, right? You can yeah. plug in any string you want. You could use CI systems to publish your images and wire this information into your CDK application, then pass that information into your container. Uh, but this is it's pretty rudimentary. We can obviously evolve it and make it more sophisticated, but it, it will it, it, it will, it's definitely going to serve the purposes of, the, of this uh, demo. So right, the that's right. libraries is just by installing them, right? Like any other library that you'd install, uh, Yarn add in the, in the TypeScript JavaScript world, or npm install uh, in, so cdk's image a lot i'm gonna ask you to go a little bit faster now okay so <laughs> i need the image okay let's do this image equals new image see it brought it over from cdk's yeah. and then i'm gonna do this and deer would be image deer and registry would be this local host a thousand and here I'm going to just put image URL. And now, how do I get the service from the uh, like? Do I need to create a service now? Yeah. So we have to create a service, right? Because an ingress backend is a service. But actually, if you look at the deployment and the API on the deployment construct, you'll notice something that is very familiar to Kubernetes users, and that's the expose method. And it, it's essentially mimicking the behavior of uh, cube cuddle expose, right? Where where you can pass in a deployment and the expose will actually wire and create a service that selects that deployment and routes to it. Okay. And, and you can actually get the service by just storing the return value of this. I think I need to specify the out the container port here, right? Yeah. And then the, do I need to somehow map the out the external port and the internal port or is it all done for me? So we'll, We'll see it in the manifest. It's it's done for you, of course. Um, we're talking cool. about it, but uh, but yeah, this is so you can just choose any any exposed port you want. This is like an external port that you want uh, your users to 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 access. Your, your um, the service basically. The, the service. Port yeah. that the service exposing. Yeah, if you want to access the service, then this is the port you're going to use. We're going to be using ingress, right? So we have another layer of indirection. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, so this is compiling now. I get a service. I can pass it over to the backend, and then edit. Here's here's a tenant. Here's a tenant of the CDK. If it's compiling, it should work. Okay. Let's let's see. Should I do D? So now it should actually build our our image. Oh, yeah. cool! Building and pushing. Very nice. And this is failing because creating. Oh no. Nginx denied and request host and path counter. Request host. Do we have something? It's already defined an ingress. Oh, maybe it's from a diff different. Uh, let me let me see if I we don't we have a uh, um some some previous thing. Yeah. Oh, we didn't. Uh, okay. Okay. Try again. Just some uh, leftovers from a uh, previous test. <laughs> Surprisingly, same name of the. <laughs> but that—that's the thing, right? It's—it's it's stable names, so it's always going to be the same name. 
Okay, so this looks like it worked. Uh, I've got my router deployed here. Okay. Should I just curl? Let's just curl. Yeah, let's just curl it. Yay! Okay, cool. This is pretty this, cool. This is this is the experience we want. Um, so, so now just recap, just a, a quick creep cap. Okay, I want to emphasize a few things. Let me put this here. I don't want to it. So I think like the 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 interesting discussion here is about the mental model. What what you described earlier. As far as the user, users of this router are concerned, they don't know about ingress. They don't know about deployments. They don't know about this image thing. All they know is that they've put their code under counter app and they've basically mounted in or installed it onto this route. And that's it. Yeah. That's it. And that's, and that's like, the, this is the, the, the next level of abstraction, right? Now you can publish this as, a, as an NPM library or anything. And users can use it without having to know, you know, what what ingresses are or services or deployments. So it's a completely different kind of mental model. Yeah, it's a different universe. It's not the Kubernetes universe. It's now the yeah. router universe. And it's a universe that's more familiar with our regular runtime code, right? Appl applicative code. This is how you would create like an Express application or right. or a Django application. It's yeah, right. It's a pretty common mental yeah. model. In that. Okay, um, but this is this is still a bit of a toy. I feel like uh, I yeah, mean, let's, uh, let's, in most let's cases, add one uh, more than one replica of something, and then you know stuff yeah. like that. So let's let's add, let's do some productization for this uh, for this little router. So the first thing we want to do is actually add like a, a readiness probe, right? Right. Most most uh, pods need a way to to make sure that they're up and running before Kubernetes right. can send traffic to them. Right. Uh, and we need you know to... what, my, my, my users don't really care about that because they're just like serving HTTP traffic. And so as far as they're concerned, you know, exactly. if you can hit that endpoint, it should work, right? Like it, it's, it's probably fine. Yeah. We can think about like maybe exposing something later on, but definitely like for the common thing, simplest it's thing, like we can just- HTTP get uh, slash. Yeah. So let's see what, what API the container has. Uh, I think the, the readiness probe should be on the container, right? Readiness. Yeah. Okay, so determines when ready, the container is ready and it accepts a probe class, which is, I think, another union-like thing. Uh, yeah. Probe dot from. Oh, you got can it. Do two types here, right? So you can either do HTTP or a command. So okay. that way you and slash, and that's it. And it knows the port because yeah. I just said it, right? So there's no reason. That's pretty exactly. Cool. You just just a line ab above that used to be specified. So now, if it. I deploy this, I, I should get readiness probes. And you see that the user didn't change anything. So think you know think this library, this li router library added readiness pro uh, readiness probes. Released a new program. The user, the user just right. picked that up, and now they have readiness probes across my entire company. Right? Like I nobody mm -hmm. had to do anything. Pretty neat. I, I want to see the readiness probes if you don't mind part of my deployment, right? Oh, it's, it's it should be in part of the, uh, the pod. pod. Yeah. Also. Oh, I see the other one terminating. That's pretty cool. Pod. OK. Readiness, HTTP gets slash. Oh, that's pretty yep. nifty. OK, cool. What else? All right. So what else we need to replicas let's do multiple replicas yeah so if we if we're going to do replicas we're going to have to change our implementation a bit because we're doing you know this native naive kind of uh, in memory counter so what let's 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 implement a persistent counter like with redis for example yeah actually i think we already have that problem because we just you know killed our previous counter right yeah and and I, obviously Reset, yeah. So persistency, obviously we can do a counter without like persisting. So you want to add a Redis, uh, let's, I want to first like, you know, deploy multiple, let's say we just deploy three replicas of every time. Let's keep it simple, yeah. right? Um, so I'm just going to go to my router and replicas are here, right? Part of the, okay. Yeah. And yeah now all right. So three. And if I deploy this, You know what I'm going to just add one tiny, tiny thing here. 
Yeah. Now we're uh, getting real. <laughs> yeah, it's just so we can, you know, differentiate between and see and see the route, the traffic routing to different parts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we got to do this. Okay, but I can already see the two, the f a few instances, yeah. right? The counters are jumping around, which is pretty cute. And at some point, I'm going to need to see the the host name as those things are okay we'll just let that uh, run all right redis yeah so let's, 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 I, I always install through helm everything all you know those things definitely let's uh let's let's try and install it from helm and we actually have support for helm in cdk so where you can uh, there's there's something called the helm construct of course uh and sure. you can you can specify which chart you want to install and the helm construct will actually call helm underneath right for you the same way that cdk's image calls docker so all these build tools are kind of encapsulated or abstracted away uh, using these constructs it's not it's not going to actually install the chart it's going to use helm template which is yeah uh, sorry to, to uh, generate that uh, allows you to basically synthesize the template from a chart you know given a set yeah. of values and things like that right yeah, yeah. okay so what so is the required we, field we, here is chart um Vietnami Redis, right? Yep, that's the one. And what else do we have here? I see Helm executable, Helm flags gives me some ability to control the execution. And then the release name is optional, which, yeah, the, which probably says that it's gonna allocate it based on where the construct is, yeah. which is pretty cool. I know that I know that Helm charts, like the, the Redis Helm chart actually generates convent like it generates values based on release names right that's the convention so for example derived from the release name exactly so for example we'll see it later like the redis password is going to actually be extracted from a secret that has a name with a convention yeah so we'll see that um, and you can access that release name if you store the helm in a in a construct in a constant and, and use it oh cool so if i do redis it is releases same yeah. same as with the with the name. so I guess releases are kind of like the scope right like the construct scope for the Helm chart it yeah. gives the ability to basically install two Redis in the same cluster with different release names so the resources are not conflicting but it's basically one level of nesting there's no tree it's just a single kind of namespacing yeah. for the chart okay um, do I need any values? I see that I have yeah, some let's, kind let's, of. Uh, let's just uh, input some values for our demo sake uh, to disable the, the Redis clustering. We're just going to do a single node, uh, okay. simple so what's Redis. The, what's the configuration? Yeah, so unfortunately, this part isn't, isn't typed, um, but so we, we need to take oh, a look at the configuration. But, but I can, the, but I can tell you that it's, uh, it's basically you do cluster uh, and then enable false. That's that's it. Okay, and you know I can actually like derive this value from some configuration of my chart. So I can add like something like this is a, you know a dev environment, and in the dev environment I'm going to disable the cluster, and in production I can so it, I can actually write the the logic that uh, decides what what is the configuration of my Redis cluster. Yes, okay. yes but we're not going to do that now <laughs> <laughs> because we don't have enough time, and I'm going to wrap over. Okay, okay. okay. Now I need to. Okay, so now I've got my, so this is it. That's all I need to deploy Redis cluster. So that should be it, basically, okay. yes. Show me, show me. Now, obviously we're gonna need to change our code, right? The, 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 the this HTTP server that is going to have to connect to Redis. Right. And it's going to have to connect with the password. So we're gonna- have... I know that you've been, you know, hacking on this earlier. Can you send me the, the code, I don't want to spend too much time like writing that code. Yeah, let me send you that. Okay, so it does seem like something happened here. Let me look at this. Pretty cool. This is run already running. That's nice. Ready to accept connections, Ellie. <laughs> that uh, was that was magical. I want to, but I mean, I want yeah, this is. <laughs> this is uh, CDK and Helm, right? We have to give uh, we have to give uh, salute to Helm for creating a yeah, nice yeah. chart. Yeah, this is but this is pretty nice because 
I think it encapsulates the, the fact that I'm using Helm behind this construct. And so yeah. it, I, I guess I can actually wrap this into a construct, like Redis construct, and then yeah. I do that. And then, definitely. And then you can actually provide for your users, right? You can provide additional typing that isn't available at the, at the lower level, right? So for example, these values. Do this again. And yeah. And here. since you're already doing that, then we should also expo expose some uh, properties for this construct because we, we know that we're going to need the password for Redis in order to connect, right? So it, it would be nice if we have like a property or a method on this class that the exposes password. the password. And, and the same thing for, for the host you name. Think the password is going to be stored in, let me, I think, I let me see, a secret, right? Yeah. So, this. I'm going to tell you, because I've, I've been dealing with this chart for a while now. So, I'm, so the, here, the, here, so it's basically yeah, exactly. the name, the release name and Redis password. Yeah. So you do, you're going to do, yeah, read only password. Okay. So and this is going to be, its yeah. type is going to be a secret value. We have like this notion of a secret value in TDK, okay. which is essentially cool. Cool a combination of a secret and a specific key inside that secret to extract the value. I see. So it's basically kind of like a pair. Yeah. And then I guess password equals. So you create a secret. You, you can reference an existing secret by using secret dot from. And again, this from uh, oh. pattern. And the secret name is release name. It's going to be the release name. Why yeah. Call it reduce. <laughs> <laughs> And then the key is what we saw here, right? Like the yeah. And this is like uh, you know the 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 Helm chart creating for us. So that's basically cool. a convention that the Helm yeah. chart has, and we can codify this convention into the construct. And then from the user's perspective, they just say dot password, and they get a secret value, and they they can use it opaquely. Right. They don't understand. Okay, that's pretty pretty strong. All right, so we have five the hosts, I guess, right? We have five minutes allowed. We need to. Master. <laughs> um, this is the host, right? The host name. Oh, the host. Yeah. And how how do you? Yeah. So the host name is actually again, it's the release name, and it's suffixed with the master. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So now, so now we can... I'm gonna do this. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay, I'm back. There it is. Yeah. And I need. All right. So, okay, give me. Uh, did you send me? Okay, I got it. I got your code. Yeah. I mean, I'm just gonna copy and paste that into our app to save some time. And we'll go. Let's go through this for just a second. Okay, so I understand what's going on here. Quickly. So installs Redis. <laughs> oh, I need. I need to install an, a dependency, right? I'm gonna add a package JSON file with Redis. Okay, cool. And don't forget to do this, right? Work dear app and then run. This this yeah. uh this this application combines pretty much every tool that I love. <laughs> <laughs> Redis. I agree about Redis totally. Um Anyway, so it creates a client and it reads the host and the password from environment variables. So we need to actually somehow Delegate, put those. Okay, well, I'll remember this, and then it creates a, an HTTP server. Oh, and it has this nice get. You can just get the counter, or you can post, and then it'll increment. Nice. Yeah. Okay, that's that looks pretty straightforward, and it's still eighty eighty. Okay, so all cool. we all we need is to basically pass this values to 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 the to the container. And if I go into the router, it's here somewhere, right? Environment. Yeah. So but what I, these values are not here, right? Because that's not the. It oh, should be so. input. And that's and that's actually okay, right? The user, it's it's okay for the user to pass these environment variables because it's the user's choice to now incorporate Redis, right? And right. so it makes sense. Right. So it's it's basically part of that mental model 
that the yeah. user comes from and says, okay, I want to run this container, this image, and pass in these environment variables to the image. Okay, so it's going to be install options, I guess. And here's a weird type script syntax for a map. <laughs> we can use rate record, right? So it's basically a string. Remember that it's an end value, right? Because um, I saw that this one's not, yeah, this basically a end value. Because I can also pass a secret, right? Like, and then this one's. Yeah, there, are, there are multiple ways of like creating environment variables in Kubernetes, and we're going to actually use uh, two of them. Uh, we'll see. Okay, so I'm just going to propagate this over here. Yeah. And here I'm going to do this, and, and so we so have the first one is the Redis post, which is just a literal value, right? It's just oh, so uh, it's the end value from value just, it's just a string and then red is password I saw that we have from from secret value secret value cool wow this looks pretty clean this is basically it really that's you're, it you're telling me this is going to actually work <laughs> well i'm i am telling you're, you that, you're but... hoping <laughs> No, I'm definitely telling you that, but don't hold it against me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's that. That was ba that was it. Um, and I guess we can start wrapping up. Actually, let's let's give it a few seconds to deploy and okay. see. Um, so I guess what we saw here is we 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 saw basically I I would say three aspects of what why CDK for Kubernetes is interesting and why in general CDK is interesting. Yeah. The first thing is just using programming languages, uh, general purpose programming language, uh, languages, object-oriented uh, tools, classes, inheritance, uh, methods, property, things stuff. like that. Very powerful tools, very familiar to most programmers. Uh, and so to that end, I feel, I feel at home. I feel like I'm, you know, I have all yeah. those tools. I, I know what to do with them. <laughs> the second thing is the ability to uh, create higher level abstractions. And, and obviously that stems from the first point, but um, the, the interesting part is this composition model, this, these constructs, because the, the power of constructs is the ability to create this consistent and deterministic uh, naming across executions. So when I change something, I know that this thing that was some, you know, in my previous execution was X, now it's gonna be Y and that's, and I'm able yeah, to map those things together. And it's basically, and it's very hard to implement this desired state mechanism without this. this without this, the, yeah. the stable, uh, stable um, yeah. naming. Yeah. And I think the third thing was was this ability to basically leverage the ecosystem of uh, the existing ecosystem of Kubernetes. Uh, we talked about CRDs and being able to import them and use them as you know L ones. Uh, we saw the Helm. Um, yeah support, which is kind of like magical, I guess. And mm -hmm. we wrapped it into a construct. We create an abstraction that hides, even hides the fact that we're, I'm using Helm. And nobody actually needs to go and, you know. Yeah. yeah, actually, you can just show for a second, like how the manifest actually looks like now. OK, let's, uh, that's, I'm actually curious. <laughs> like, it's, it's enormous, right? But but we don't we don't care. We, we stopped caring about the manifest like 20 minutes ago, because right. we, we, right? Initially, I didn't trust it, but now it feels like I, I don't really care because I feel like it, it's actually doing what I'm telling it to do. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Oh, and the other thing that we saw is we use this uh, image library, which is this just random library by some dude in Tel Aviv uh, <laughs> that uh, helped us with all this, uh, with, with you know, building and publishing the image as part of the CDK experience. Uh, which is also pretty cool, like the ability to publish these constructs and use them as class, you know, as class libraries. I can actually publish a whole application, a whole application as a class library. It's pretty. Yeah, pretty we can actually publish this counter, right? This is we we just created a persistent counter uh, that runs in Kubernetes. <laughs> right, right. Okay, this is just zero now. Oh, am I doing just get? Yeah, I'm just. That's, that's expected. Yeah. Woo. Hey, look. And different host names, yeah. The so cathartic, have... uh, cathartic uh, moment, right, is now. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I feel, I feel cathartic. <laughs> cool. Um, 
Ellie, thanks so much. Is there anything else that you wanted to? No, I just want to give, yeah, we just want to thank you for inviting me. And I just want to mention that we are currently, you know, we're putting a lot of effort into it and we really want the, the engagement of the community. Uh, there's a Slack channel. We'll, uh, you can maybe show that while I talk. Uh, there's a Slack channel you can join. Uh, there are uh, monthly community meetings that uh, you can attend and actually brainstorm with us on features and on bugs and whatever you want. Uh, and we're really, we're really excited to, to build this together, right? Uh, this is, uh, we, we, we want as many, more, as many use cases as possible and um, really making these APIs so, so fun. Pleasant, use. yeah, pleasant, delightful. Yeah. I think, uh, so yeah, the, the homepage for CD case is this one. Obviously, GitHub is, is another homepage that we're happy for you to start from. Uh, and you can find resources at the bottom of this. There's a bunch of resources about, um, uh, there's a mailing list. Uh, we've got a weekly, uh, sorry, a monthly community meeting that you're yeah, here. More, than, yeah. more than welcome to join. Uh, we have a Slack channel that's part of the CDK Dev uh, Initiative. It's, a, it's actually a community initiative by, that combines all of the CDKs, you know, the bigger CDKs. There are actually other CDKs uh, starting to pop up, but the Terraform, AWS, and Kubernetes CDKs. Um, and there's a Slack uh, team, Slack workspace that you can join, and there's a CDK channel within that workspace that we, that we monitor, and we're happy to, like, uh, talk to you. Talk to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess that's it. Um, yeah, well, we have like 10 minutes, I guess, after this uh, for, for questions, maybe yeah. a, little, a little bit more, but yeah, feel free to, to join us and, and, and ask questions. Cool. Th uh, thanks so much for joining me. It's, uh, it's been way more fun to do it with you than doing it alone. Definitely. Hopefully um, next year we'll get to see the people we are, we're presenting to, right? Not just uh, in maybe, the camera. Maybe. <laughs> yes. Hopefully. <laughs> Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye. See you Thanks, later. Everyone. Bye. Awesome. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Ellie. That was an awesome demo. Thank you so much for joining us for this presentation. We hope you're as excited about CD Kates as we are. Uh, we encourage you to visit us on the web, to join us on Slack and uh, chat us with your questions or the things that you're building, and also uh, join us on GitHub. We really are excited and we welcome contributions. Um, we have a lot of big things planned for the CDKs, including uh, moving to a beta in the near future here. And we're excited to see what you build, and, and we hope that you join us. Thank you. <laughs>